Amen. Hey, good morning, Spout Springs Church. It's great to be with you, and welcome to the early edition. And uh, my name is Rich Culp. I uh, am not the normal teaching pastor at Spout Springs Church. I just want you to know that. I am the abnormal uh, teaching pastor. Every once in a while, they invite me in, and I get this incredible privilege to open up God's Word with you. Uh, before we get going any further, I just want to again give those young men a round of applause for getting baptized today. Um, I love that. Young men leading the way and doing what matters. So I um, also want to say thank you to the parents that are involved in the discipleship of those guys' lives. So it is a great joy, as I've already said, to be a part of Spout Springs Church. Love the fact that you guys do what matters in everything from the five and two to investing into the lives of soldiers. By the way, that is what I get to do. My main ministry is I lead a network of churches around Fort Bragg called the Centurion Project. And um, what we're doing, we're networking together. We're partnering together to better disciple military leaders and provide soul care support to those same military leaders so that they will be consummate professionals in everything that they do and will advance their mission in the Army, the Air Force, even the Marine Corps, all God's Marines said, okay. <laughs> so we don't have any Marines, that's all right, but um, <clears throat> I am a Marine, and uh, oorah. So what we're doing is we're trying to figure out, particularly Marines, to get them on mission. I don't want, you know, Marines are a little bit of kind of a wackadoodle breed, but they are. Um, we're, what we're trying to do is to get them on mission for Jesus Christ, and so that's what I get to do. But it's my privilege today to open up God's Word for you. But before we get started, let me ask you this question. How many of you, like Alexander, have ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day by a raise of hand? Okay, thank you for being honest in church. She's the only one. You in the back, thank you, thank you. Uh, how many of you have ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad seven months? Like every day. And a lot of people, that's interesting, a lot of people raise their hands to that. Uh, my wife, Jenny, and I, we had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad seven months. We moved to Tampa, Florida to actually plant a church. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory. I had been involved in a church in Maryland for about 12 years, and we saw that church grow and expand and send missionaries all over the world, and uh, a national organization called Harvest Bible Fellowship saw what we were doing, and I got recruited to help them do church restoration all over the United States, and for that, um, I got sent to Tampa, Florida. Now, I need to tell you a little bit of a piece of information about why we went to Tampa. We were told that this national organization, Harvest Bible Fellowship, they had, it's led by a guy, a guy named James McDonald, if any of you know James McDonald Ministries, um, they had sold either sermons or Bible studies or t-shirts and merchandise to 2,700 homes in the Tampa Bay region, 2,000. 700 homes, not just people, but homes in the Tampa Bay region. When I heard that, and when the executive director of Harvest Bible Fellowship heard that, 
we were salivating. We were going to push an email, send a message out to those 2,700 homes, and go down there, and it would be like instant church. It was my next big thing. It was the stepping stone for me to become a mega church pastor. Um, so I moved my family and uh, everything that we own. We moved down to Tampa Bay on that data. We got to Tampa. We held our first open house. We were really excited. We had sent that email out to the 2,700 homes, and we had rented this big conference center, and we had banners and food and music was playing. We, we knew that we wouldn't get 2,700 homes, but we think, you know, maybe one or two or three or 400 homes would show up. Eleven people showed up. Nine of them actually were there to hear James McDonald. Six of them left when they found out that he wasn't going to be there. I had moved my family. 35 days later, and it's a longer story, my oldest, well, it's already out there. And she knows this. I tell this story. Uh, she lost 35 pounds, and her hair was falling out. She was struggling from an eating disorder. She's doing fine today. Um, it was the longest seven months of our lives. It was supposed to be the next big thing that God was going to do in our lives. We told our kids that. Um, but seven months later, we were basically penniless. Uh, we moved into the basement of my dad's house. And we lived there for a couple of months. And, and God has been incredibly kind uh, very, 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 very thankful for his faithfulness during that time. It was a time of uh, humiliation for me. By the way, there's two paths in life. There's either the path of humiliation or the path of humility. Um, and I was on the path of humiliation, and I'm incredibly thankful for it. Thankful for that curriculum. I don't want to sign up for it again. Okay, I really don't. And my family's doing great. We're doing great. The Lord has been incredibly kind. I, I tell you all of that to tell you this, that all of us have dreams and we all have expectations. We're all looking for the next big thing, um, whether it is a challenge or an opportunity, as Steve uh, shared with us last week. But along with that challenge of opportunity, there are also problems that we need to work through. We need to be careful. And, 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 everybody say and. And we ought to do some research before we actually move our family down to Tampa to figure out, yes, this is perhaps God's plan, but have you done the reconnaissance before you actually deploy into that particular situation? Do you actually have any good intel into whatever your next big thing happens to be? So with all of that, I'd ask that you would turn to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2 is kind of like an interlude in the progression of the story as uh, the Israelites are going to take the land, and particularly Jericho. As you learned last week, Jericho doesn't happen until chapter 6. And there's five chapters of getting ready, getting ready, getting ready, or as the sermon series is called, but first, make sure that you know that you're ready to go before you actually go. But chapter 2 is this kind of interesting interlude. It's a spy story. It's got two spies and some interesting characters. It's one of the most interesting and intriguing chapters in the entire Bible. The title of the message this morning is Mission Impossible. And if you're following along with the outline, um, you will not be disavowed. Disavowed. You know how they do it with 007, you know, it's got this smoking like little message and then says, if you get caught, you will be disavowed. That is not how God works. He is always faithful, even when we are faithless. And so we're going to see a little bit of that in this particular story. The way that the story breaks out is into three different scenes. There is the scene at the doorway. There is a scene on the rooftop, and then there's a third and final scene where it's at a window. Okay, so you got it. You got the three scenes. We're going to kind of read through the story and pick up some principles for life as we move through the story. At the doorway, 
and we'll add this particular tagline, at the doorway with the harlot. Because the harlot is a particularly important person in this story. At the doorway with the harlot, at the rooftop with the harlot, and at the window with the harlot. So those are the three scenes, and so we'll go through. And we're looking for, loved ones, we're looking for um, not just practices, but more importantly, principles. So you shouldn't come into the Old Testament narrative uh, or any kind of story of the Old Testament and say, okay, if I'm going to be faithful to Jesus, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing that they're doing. So if you did that as you read chapter 2 of Joshua, this is the kind of the application that you would have as you moved into that particular story. Okay, so for my next big thing, what I should do is to get involved with a, with a prostitute. That's, that's number one, because I want God to bless me. And then I'm going to hide in some haystacks, wherever that might be. That would be practice number two. And then the third one, I'm going to climb out a window. And that's the way you actually affirm and get God's blessing in your life. Okay, so you don't do that. What you do is you pull out principles for life as you move for, through these particular stories. You got it? You got it? Shake your head yes, I'll just keep going through this. Okay, thank you. All right, so let, let's begin here in uh, Joshua chapter 1, just to get a little bit of the backstory. I want to look at verse 9, if you're following along in your Bibles, and we'll try to get it up in the screen. This is just a reminder of what has happened previously, in, uh, but first, verse 9, we read this, that Joshua says to, um, well, actually God says to Joshua, he says, uh, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. Within three days you are to pass. And over this Jordan and take the possession of the land that the Lord is giving you. And that's Joshua 1.11. Uh, verse 9 actually says this, and I want to bring this out if you're following along in your Bible. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous... Uh, and that's kind of a theme throughout the entirety of the book of Joshua. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? And then these words, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Those go along with be strong and courageous. Is do not be frightened. And as you heard last week, there's reason to be frightened in the land. And do not be confused. There's also a reason that it's going to be confusing. It's going to be awkward as you move into your next big thing, particularly the taking of the promised land. This land that's filled with milk and honey, there's still going to be a reason to be afraid and to be confused. And so be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Okay, and so what we're going to do is get some intel as to why and how we can move into whatever our next big thing is and do it with faithfulness. Uh, one last verse before we actually get into chapter 2. It's at the end of uh, Joshua chapter 1. This is a, and it's verse 18. Hopefully we got that one up on the screen. It says this. Um, this is the people speaking back to Joshua. They say, whoever rebels against your commandment, Joshua, and disobeys your words, whatever you command him, he shall be put to death. Only, and here it is again, be strong and courageous. In other words, if you don't do what Joshua does, we're going to put you to death. Because we see God's calling on his life. Now, this is incredibly important because there is in the history of the um, Jews coming out of Egypt, they were getting ready to go into the promised land 40 years early, and they did this thing. They sent some spies into the land. You remember the story in Numbers 14 at Kadesh Barnea? They sent how many spies into the land? Yell it out if you know. They sent 12, one from each tribe, how many of the spies brought good news or a good report back? Only two. And what did the people say when the other ten were spreading all this bad news? They said, we can't go in there. There's giants in the land. The other two said, um, we should go in because the Lord is with us. Now, who were those two spies that gave the good report? We're just doing a little bit of background work here. Joshua and... Yeah, love Caleb, that old guy. We're going to take the world. We're going to clap for Caleb. But Joshua is one of those spies that brought in the good 
good report. But they didn't go, and so they're wandering in the land for 40 years. And what happened to the generation, the first generation, that were afraid and not courageous? What happened to them? They died. And so this next generation said, "Uh uh-uh, look, we're going in. Like, if you're not coming with, you're dead, brother. I'm just telling you. But they didn't immediately go into the land. Joshua, being one of the original spies, he sends two. That's kind of interesting because there's only two that gave the good report. He sends two in, and watch what happens. Okay, so now I gave you all that background. We're finally going to get into the text. Here's Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly. Secretly. Okay. Shh. There's background music. It's... Okay. Secretly, and be careful how you say this next word. Or you'll be in Shidem. Okay, so they sent from Shidem as spies saying, go view the land and especially Jericho. I want you to go and get some intel about this area and particularly Jericho, because Jericho is the first and important city for taking the land. By the way, it is the promised land. It is the land of milk and honey, but there are enemies in the land And Jericho is a place that no one gets in and no one gets out. You've got to take Jericho. Jericho's got to fall first, so we're going to get some intel about Jericho. And so they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Okay, so who knows why they came to this particular house, and it's a uh, prostitute, and her name is Rahab. We'll talk about her in just a moment. Now look at verse 2. I want to tell you is before we move into verse two, the background music changes. Um, it's not dun 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 dun. dun, dun, dun. It's um, whatever the theme is for the Pink Panther. Do you know the Pink Panther theme? Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Okay, so it's just you know the characters is Daniel Craig and um, who's that guy that does Mission Impossible? Short guy. Tom Cruise. Okay, so it's those two. In verse 2, it's now shifted. It's Steve Martin and Martin Short. Okay, so there, just look at it. Okay, and it was told the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Okay, we're we're two verses in. They're already, you know, made. Their their cover is blown. Now look at verse 3. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered into your house, for they have come to search out the land. They're three verses into this story on their secret mission that was only supposed to take three days. You know, as soon as they show up, it's like the king knows that they're there. He knows why they're there, and he knows where they are. It's absolutely blown. Um, I was talking to Steve about this particular thing. He, he said that's because they were wearing shirts. Um, one of the spies said, I'm a spy. And that's what it says on the shirt. The other one had, I'm with stupid. And <laughs> it's just absolutely amazing, um, tragically amazing. So the king knows, and so the king sends out some men to Rahab's door. Uh, Verse 4, let's just look at that, but the woman. And I want want to just stop there and think about Rahab for a moment. Um, uh, Rahab, she's a a prostitute. She is a hooker. She's a a lady of the night. She's a call girl. You know, whatever name you want to, that's who she is. I have three daughters. Um, how many of you have ever had, three, had a daughter or you were a daughter? How many of you? Okay, so more than half of you are either a daughter. This is what I know about little girls. They don't, when they're little, they don't grow up thinking, you know, I, I think it's my life dream. It's my next big thing to become a prostitute. They, they don't think that way at all. Um, when they're 12 years old, um, they're not thinking, you know, I, I think I would like to live in an immoral city and have men abuse me on the reg. Okay. And I realize that there's kids in here, and now you're going to have some difficult conversations on the way home. Um, but this is the Bible. 
This is what I also uh, want you to think about as you think about Rahab. Um, she, uh, she doesn't have a really good moral compass. I'm just kidding. She grew up in a very immoral society. And um, we don't know actually how she became a, a prostitute. Um, she didn't grow up, let me just say it this way, she didn't grow up in a Christian home, all right? She didn't have any kind of structure. Some commentators actually would say that she was trafficked by her parents because that's how they kind of did business and that's how they survived. Um, I, I, we don't know. We just don't know. But we know that no human little girl wants to grow up and no woman really wants to be in the business of prostitution. They, they don't. We know that. I think we can agree on that. The other thing, before we go any further and we get judgmental or whatever, I mean, there's, I, we, I traffic with some fundamental people every once in a while, churches, and they're like, oh, you shouldn't bring up, Rahab shouldn't even be in the Bible. I'm like, what are you talking about? Rahab is a trophy of God's grace. She, she really is. She, she is so important in the biblical narrative we'll talk about later. Um, this past week, I uh, came into contact and heard a particular quote I haven't heard in a long time from C.S. Lewis. It's this. Um, it says this. This is C.S. Lewis. For the first time, I examined myself with a serious practical purpose. Do you know who C.S. Lewis is? You know, he's a great Christian author, great Christian thinker. But he examined himself with a seriously practical purpose, and there I found what appalled me. Look at this. A zoo of lust, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, and a Harlem of fonded hatreds. I, I read that. Maybe you read that. And I'm Rahab. And so are you. And everybody has a past. But this is what I want to tell you, loved ones, is that God uses people just like Rahab. It's not like we would go over to this section and say, hey, those people over there, Bedlam, you know, zoo. Um, or we could go over to you and say, those people over there, Bedlam, zoo, no. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Andy Stanley is this very simple quote. It says, I know a mess when I see one, because I am one. And you move towards the mess of other people. So she's got some mess in her life. Well, one last thing about Rahab before we actually move on from her. What could she have done at this particular moment? She's a businesswoman. I tell you what she could have done. She could have sold those two spies out really quickly. And probably turned a pretty good profit because that's what she does. But what does she do here? Let's keep reading in this particular story. It's fascinating. <clears throat> Verse 4. And the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, and I love this, true. I have it highlighted in my Bible. We've got it highlighted up there. True. Okay, so what's true? Let's put a lie detector test onto Rahab. Okay, just for the fun of it. True, the men came to me. True or false? Is that true? True. All right, good. So that's true. <clears throat> uh, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. True or false? Okay, it's probably true. She you didn't ask them what town, where they grew up. I don't know. Okay, so I didn't know where they came from. <clears throat> and verse 5, And when the gate was about to be closed, and at dark, the men went out. Let's just stop there. True or false? Okay, we're getting a little into the shady area. They went out. We know, if you know the story, they went out on top of her roof, so they're out. And so, eh, you know, it's kind of true. Maybe. <laughs> um, and then this one, and I don't know where the men went. Okay, so now she's being like a lawyer. You know what lawyers do. Okay, it's not that lawyers lie. They just don't tell the complete truth. So she, oh, yeah, well, I don't know exactly where they are. <laughs> I mean, they're hiding, we'll find out. Um, I did not know where they were from, and when the gate was about to close, they went out, and then I love this, pursue them, pursue them quickly, and you will overtake them. And they listen to her, so they leave. Okay, now, look at verse 7. It says, so the men pursued 
after them and on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords, that's important for you later, in these low areas of water, they went down to the fords because they figured that's where these guys are coming across and back over. And the gate was shut as the pursuers had gone out. Okay, so these pursuers, the king's men, they came. They're looking for these two spies. She misdirects them. Let's just use that word. She misdirects them, and they go out hunting for these two spies out by the fords. Now, let's take a couple of moments and talk about some applicational principles for you and me. Okay? For your next big thing, whether it's an opportunity or a problem or a challenge, what are some principles, not necessarily practices, okay? I wouldn't suggest to you that if you're looking forward to your next big thing that you go get mixed up with a prostitute. Probably not going to work out well with you. But here are some principles. We'll put them up on the screen. It's this, that as we go in towards our next big thing, we better have a situational resiliency to God's greater contingency. Because you and I, whatever our next big thing is, it may not even be a big thing. It may be just this week that you're going to encounter some immediate danger. You could. It's going to be awkward. And there's going to be some suspect characters that you and I are going to interact with. That's true because we're humans. And we live in a difficult place and at a difficult time. And so you just need to know that. That's a part of your situational awareness as you move into whatever you're going to move into. This idea of God's greater contingency, you put those two things together, resiliency and God's contingency. Loved ones, it's called dependency. At every moment and every step, I am trusting that God is watching over me. And He may redesign things and give me opportunities that are disguised as challenges or awkward situations or difficult people, or suspect people. And I tell you this for a number of reasons. As you're thinking about whatever your next big thing is, a lot of the time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to escape some particular problem or frustration that we're experiencing right now. And we just think, oh, well, I'm going to create my own promised land, and I'm going to take that big step. Not realizing that most of the time your problems follow you and there are problems waiting for you for wherever you're going to go, whatever you want to do next. Because we often, as humans, we like to take the path of least resistance. We're like water that is always trying to get down, 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 down. And you keep following water as it follows the path of least resistance and ends up in a ditch. So loved ones particularly those of you who name the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior, because there's some ridiculous idea in the Christian community that if I'm in the middle of God's will, it'll be so easy and perfect, and I'll have peace. That's a wonderful sentiment, except for the Bible and for Jesus, who says, in this world you will have trouble. Christians, I hear this all the time. God will not give me more than I can handle. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God will give you more than you can handle because He wants you to be in a place of absolute resiliency and dependency for what He might do in the next season of your life. Are you with me, gang? Okay. We, yes, everyone wants to take the easy path. God does not want you to take the easy path. He wants you to take the dependent and resilient path forward to your next big thing. Okay, so that's scene one. We're going to move to scene two, but this is what we're going to do. Okay, you're going to get to be spies. Are you ready? We haven't heard from the spies yet, so you're going to, be, you're going to pretend that you're spies, and you're going to go to verses 8 through 14, and you're going to break up into little spy groups, okay? So what we want, I want, what the church wants, we want you to get connected to a small group where you actually study the Bible in a group. So we're going to model that today. You're going to read the next verses 8 to 14 together. Break up in little groups, and maybe you'll have to be a little bit courageous and move towards someone that you don't know. And I want you to pull out some intel from verses 8 to 14. You got it? It's only going to take... A minute and a half, okay? I'm going to take a break, drink some water while you guys are working, all right? I mean, look, 
Uh, who's that guy that plays for the Kansas City Chiefs as quarterback, that guy? Patrick, okay. Patty. Even he takes breaks. So you guys break up into your little small groups. It's just a test of you getting involved in a, in a life group or a small group here. You ready? Go. We'll give you about 90 seconds. I'm keeping the clock. Okay, but look, in verses 8 through 14, I want you to go find some intel, okay? Some good intel. Love to see parents working with their kids, studying the Bible together right here in church. <clears throat> Going to get some strategic information. All right, 15 seconds. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, back away from the table. Okay, good job. How'd that go for you? Was that kind of fun? Kind of fun? What did you learn? What did you, don't tell me, tell, get into a group and then you can share with other people in your group, all right? Let me tell you what you didn't find in this particular passage. The key code for the back gate. <sighs> um, you didn't find the king on Tuesdays, he actually goes fishing and you can go down there and you can capture him, hold him ransom and then you can get into the city. You didn't find that at all. You didn't find, hey, um... You guys, you should know that there's this one section of the wall that's already kind of weak, and like when you go by there, if you like stomp really hard, it'll fall down. That's not what they found. What did they find? They found one of the greatest confessions in all of Scripture from Rahab. Um, they found, you ever heard this expression um, when you were describing someone that's absolutely amazing, you say, that, that person, that woman, that man is a force of nature. You ever heard that expression? What you see in Rahab is a woman, she's a force of God's nature. That God's reputation has gone before these spies, and they realize about how great our God is. Just like Steve told you last week that the goal of reading the Bible and studying the Bible that you guys just did is not, I'm going to say, not only to be a guide for life, okay? It's to discover the very nature of God and then put yourself in alignment with God and then that becomes the guide of your life. Okay, you got it? Are you with me, gang? All right, so now let's just read quickly through these next couple of verses, and we'll pull out a couple of things. Here it is. Um, <clears throat> Got to put my glasses on. Can't read anymore for some reason. Um, verse 8, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. We know this and we have heard. Do you believe it? I would insert there, middle of verse 10. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Shihon and Og, whom you, interesting word here, you devoted it's this idea of this religious, this spiritual commitment to God's purpose, whom you devoted to destruction. I, I want to be honest with you, loved ones. The enemies of God, then, now, forever, 
Because of their rebellion against the Lord God, they're devoted to destruction. Spending an eternity apart from Him in a place called hell. Let's just be honest about it. Devoted. Because they devoted themselves to a rebellion against God, then God in His complete justice and righteousness said they're devoted to destruction. Verse 11, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. And then the the end of verse 11, this great confession of the faith. For the Lord your God, He is the God in the heavens above and on the earth below. That statement in that particular cultural context where there were not a pantheon of gods, but there was a multitude of gods, gods of the river, gods of the trees, gods of the mountains, gods of everywhere that you went, she realizes he is the maker of heaven and earth. And she's aligning herself with him. She um, could have saved herself from the king. But what she does She aligns herself with the very nature of God. He is the master. And he is majestic. And she declares it in verse 11. Keep reading. Now then, verse 12. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly. See this little word kindly? It'll show up two more times. uh, As I have dealt kindly with you. You also will deal kindly with my father's house. We don't know what happened to this girl as a child. I'm just telling you it wasn't great. Will you deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And finally, the spies speak. It's the first time that we hear from them in the entire story. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal, here it is, kindly and faithfully with you. And that's the end of scene two. This declaration of the majesty of God, His nature, and then not just that He's devoted people to destruction and that He is the God of the heavens and on earth, but this little word, kindly, is a very important and powerful word in the Hebrew culture. It is the word hesed. Okay, everyone say hesed. The word means steadfast loving kindness. The word means covenantal love. The word means a stubborn and committed love for his people. Those people that align with him because he set their love towards them. And that love, it's not just that we have a love for God. That love for God actually is extended to the love for other people your family, your brothers, your sisters. So powerful this morning as we watch the baptism. It is a demonstration of God's love for us, but it's also a demonstration to you and to me that these boys, they were baptized, similar to dying with Christ, and they're raised again as Christ was raised. Um. A declaration of covenantal love to his covenantal people. Will you deal kindly? And so I say all of that to say this as kind of the the principles. It's not uh, actionable intel. It's actually attitudinal um, intel. It's this, is that as we go to our next big thing, we'll put it up on the screen, we need spiritual fidelity to God's greater insurgency. God has already gone before them. And God is out in front of you with the people that you Do business with. I love that word. If you don't tell anybody about our business. The people that you go to school with. Your next big thing involves people who need to know and experience 
the love of God, both his majesty and his mercy, because we are his agents. Whatever you are doing in your next big thing, you are doing for God's greater glory and for the good of other people. That's what you and I are called to do. Um, as a pastor for the past 32 years, I've had a number of people who are making a transition. They're going to get a new job. They're going to get a, a new boyfriend. They're going to get a new girlfriend. And they come to me and they say, what do you think about this? Um, we're, it's a cool city and it's a really great opportunity. You're going to make a lot of money. My first question is, what impact is it going to have on your faith? What impact is it going to have on the faith of your family? And what impact is it going to have on the faith of your friends? Well, I haven't thought about that yet. Okay, well, you need to start thinking about that because that is your first priority. Or when I'm talking to young men, like, that girl is so hot. Man, I'm quite sure that this is God's will for me to get involved with her. I know she's not a faithful follower of Christ, but she's hot. I will convert her. Yeah, and then three months later, she's the bane of his existence. How is this going to impact you? Your next big thing, your next big... How are you going to maintain faith to God and be a part of what he's doing, which is extending his love to other people wherever they are? Okay. All right, real quickly, because we're way out of time. Um, last scene, this is powerful. We'll read through it pretty quickly. <clears throat> Verse 15, then she let them down by a rope through the window, and her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. By the way, there were a set of two walls around Jerusalem, so she lived between the two walls. You can study this on your own. It's pretty interesting. But it just gives you this historical context that this really happened. And she said to them, go into the hills and the pursuers will encounter you and hide there for three days with the pursuers until they have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours. We'll be guiltless. We won't give up our vow that you have made us swear. Verse 18, behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord into the window. Notice not a rope. It's a scarlet cord. Why were these guys carrying around a scarlet cord? It has to be hearkening back to the Exodus when they put blood on the, on the doors. It was a reminder for them to stay in the house when the, the death angel came. It had to be a reminder. Um, take this cord and put it in the window which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's house. So then if anyone goes out of doors, you got to stay. It's just like the Exodus. you got to stay in the house. Don't go out into the street. If he does, his blood will be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if the hand is laid on anyone who is in your house, his blood, this, this blood covenant coming through shall be on our head. We're making a life and death covenant with you. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless in respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your word, so be it. And then she sent them away and they departed. She tied, the, she tied that scarlet cord in the window. They departed and they went into the hills and they remained there three days. Three days, three days, three days. Until the pursuers returned and the pursuers searched all along the way and they found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over, and they came to Joshua, who's been like, okay, guys, like it's been three days, three days, three days. And they told all that happened to them. Love verse 24. And they said to Joshua, truly. Remember the word true, 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 true. It's a vow, truly. Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. All, all, all the inhabitants of the land except for one melt away. And what is her name? Rahab. That's right, Rahab. Loved ones, you are Rahab's legacy. You really are. They thought they had a mission that was all about them getting into the promised land. I want to tell you that God has a mission within their particular mission. It is the salvation of Rahab. Rahab, she becomes the great-grandmother of a guy named David. You know who David is? 
Amen. And then she becomes the great, 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 25 times great grandmother of Jesus Christ. You owe your faith to this woman's strong and courageous declaration in the face of an incredible difficulty. She aligned herself with the maker of heaven and earth. And she is a part of God's greater redemptive plan that has moved all the way down to today. She's the first Gentile that came to faith, loved ones. Her great, 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 25 grandson, he died on the cross for you and for me. That is the history of God, both His majesty and His mercy towards you and me. I don't know where you are on your journey, but I want to tell you that there's a Father in Heaven that loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. And He will accept you if you accept Him. And you will not be disavowed. How is man, how is a woman, how is a child going to be saved? How can they be back in relationship between the Almighty and the Glorious One? It's the impossible mission that God became a man and lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died. So I don't know where you are on your journey. But maybe it's the first time that you've ever thought about the fact that there's a God in heaven that is righteous and He's also loving. And He wants you, He wants you to trust Him. To put your faith in Him. To be aligned with His greater mission for your life. And so today, maybe it is your day <clears throat> To make that real, to put your faith in Jesus Christ the way we do it here at Spout Springs. If you want more information about what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple, to be saved, you can come up at one of these two particular tables and there'll be a pastor or maybe I'll hang out there. And we'd love to tell you more about God's great love for you. That you would be in alignment with His mission. Maybe just taking whatever your next step is. Is. So I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. But don't keep it silent. Make it true today. Make that great confession today. Lord God, thank you for the morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be involved with your word and with your people. Uh, Lord God, we pray that you and your spirit would move powerfully this morning. Work in the hearts of your people for their good and your greater glory. Lord, I pray if there's anyone that's on the edge, they feel like, I don't know, I'm not sure, that they would remember Rahab when she was put into this crisis situation. She declared, I am for the Lord God Almighty. She didn't have a perfect faith. It wasn't all built out. It doesn't have to be. But they would take a step today they would embrace your great love for them. We pray this in Jesus' name.